Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today in our talk, Latinas Energizing Science. My name is Ana Maria Olivares and I'm originally from Colombia. I'm a project manager at the study center here at the Broad and I work in our international collaborations in Africa and Latin America. Um, I'm also a member of the Latinx group. And today's talk is actually a part of, of a series of events that we've been hosting this week in order to celebrate our Latinx Heritage Month. I will also like to share our thank our panelists, Natalia, Diana, and Susana for taking time out of, out of their schedule to join us in our talk today. Later on, my co-host, Kari, will be introducing them. Um, for those of you that might not be that familiar with Latinx, Latinx is actually a superb of the Shades at Broad Affinity Group. Um, their mission is to advocate, support, the recruitment, development, and success of the ethnic minorities at the Broad. Sharing that same mission, we at Latinx at Broad would like to build, build a community among our Latinx employees, allies, and affiliates as well. We also do events to promote our rich culture, showcase the work that our Latin scientists do, and also discuss topics that might be of interest or might be affecting our community at the moment. Um, following that mission, we decided to do today's talk. And you will see um, the importance of this talk today. We, I would like to set up the stage to this talk by introducing some statistics regarding women and more in particular, the topic of our talk will be women in the STEM world. Um, it's in the last two decades about the Latinas have increased their numbers in attending colleges and actually pursuing degrees. Their numbers have increased by almost 70%, which is quite remarkable because no other minority group has increased their attendance to school as much as Latinas. However, when we look at how many Latinas are actually joining the STEM careers, the number are not quite, uh, have not increased as much. As you can see in the table in this graph here, uh, when we look at Latinas or women, sorry, pursuing bachelor's degree, we see that they are about 34% and Latinas actually only make 4% of them. The numbers are even smaller when we look at postgraduate degrees, including master's and doctorate's degree, where women had about 34%, but Latinas actually only have 1% of those degrees. Um, apart from education, we also have the situations and the workforce. In the workforce, we are women are actually highly underrepresented where we hold only 24% of the jobs and Latinas actually account for 2.3% of those jobs. To make additional challenges for us is that many of these works are actually kind of the lower paying jobs in the STEM career. This generates an issue with the gender and ethnic gap that we know the, the pay gap. Um, so given these numbers, we thought here at Latinx that it will be a topic of interest for everyone, especially to hear the stories of three Latinas that are working in science. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this talk and I would like now to give the floor to my co-host Katty from Women at Broad. Thanks Ana Maria. So I am um, Kathy Forrest. I'm one of the co-chairs of Women at Broad. Um, Women at Broad is an affinity group um, with a focus on the inclusion and promotion of women. Um, we are becoming more and more focused on intersectionality though, um, and lifting up um, all underrepresented groups in science. So I'm truly happy to be here um, and I'm very happy to be helping Ana Maria host this panel. Um, I'd like to have our panel introduce themselves, actually, um, and maybe mention what their career path has been and what their current roles and responsibilities are um, in about five minutes, so that's really a challenge. Um, maybe, Natalia, we can start with you, and you can just give us a little, uh, a little brief of uh, where you come from and what you're doing now. Thank you, Kathy. Well, hi, everyone. I'm glad you have joined to today's session on Latin Energizing Science. My name is Natalia Bayona. I am originally from Colombia. I was born in Colombia in a very rural area embedded in the mountains of the Andes. And I grew up with a fond love to nature and science. So I went to study biology to the biggest public university in Colombia in Bogota. And when I was a, an undergrad studying biology, I got interested in many things. 
I was passionate about everything, but in the middle of my undergrad career, I got very interested in genetics specifically. So I joined the conservation genetics lab at the university back then. And I started to work two years in my in research regarding a freshwater fish population genetics. Since then I graduated and then I knew I wanted to pursue an academic career in STEM. So I moved to Mexico and that was because language wasn't a barrier back then. So it was an easy choice also because there was some opportunities in Mexico that I wouldn't have in Colombia back then. So I moved to Mexico to pursue a master's and then a PhD degree in marine science. So I keep working with genetics and I still am in, but I changed from freshwater fish to marine fish. Then I, well, my, my graduate, uh, like my years as a graduate student were very uh, important in my academic formation. And I think one of the, the experiences that I witnessed is how technologies advanced so far in the area where I was working were only no technologies about sequencing DNA, but also technologies about analyzing DNA, like reading the DNA, com computational science, bioinformatics, etc. So I was in a very lucky time in, in the world when we were having access to all these technologies and I got interested in those and I started working with genomics. So I moved from genetics to genomics. And that allowed me to start to poke scientists around the world and tell them, hey, I, I'm interested a little bit on, on this. So that helped me creating networks of collaboration with people all around and landed in a postdoctoral position here in the US where I worked for 40 years at the University of Georgia. And then this year for the first time, I'm, I, I joined the Oxford College of Emory University as a visiting assistant professor, when I'm having a blast of a time uh, teaching new generations about science and technology. So, yeah. That's so fantastic, Natalia. Thank you very much. Um, Susanna, maybe you could go next and give us a little brief overview of kind of your resume um, and where you, your experiences and what you're doing now. Um, okay, thank you very much, Kathy, and thank you very much, Anna, for inviting me today. Um, I was Anna's um, master's um, supervisor in Colombia, so that's how I know her, and, and therefore it's a big pleasure to be here today. Um, so my career, so I studied biology and microbiology at Universidad de los Andes in Bogotá, in Colombia, where I actually work now as a professor. Uh, and then after finishing my undergrad, I got, I got really, really, I pretty much fell in love with genetics and molecular biology. And I had the opportunity to work for my undergraduate thesis on um, genetics for the first time on Colombian, on humpback whales in the Pacific coast of, coast of Colombia. So it was just wonderful to be able to go to the coast and collect samples from these animals. And um, I never really thought about, I kind of, I thought about like, yeah, maybe a master's, something like that. But I never really thought about following an academic path. And actually after my undergrad, um, I was able to go to, to like connect with, um, a, um, to, to scientists in the field of uh, genetics and conservation genetics, particularly on dolphins and whales, on cetaceans. And, um, and it, was, it was amazing. I actually had a, a woman who at the time she was doing a PhD uh, on, on river dolphin genetics. And so she came to Colombia and I met her and it was just a very lucky time. And so she kind of introduced me not only to, um, she basically taught me how to sequence DNA and then she actually introduced me to a lot of the scientists in the field. And through her, I was able to, to in the end, um, go and do um, uh, uh, an internship for three months in New Zealand uh, with Dr. Scott Baker, who, uh, with who I ended up doing my PhD afterwards. Uh, not on humbugs, but on river dolphins. So I kind of, I told him, well, you know, there's a lot of people working on humbugs and I would like to work on these very difficult to study dolphin. And, she, and he was kind of like, well, okay, good luck. It's going to be challenging, you know that. So, so I I ended up doing um, a, a thesis that was really hard and really tough, traveling throughout South America and 
meeting a lot of people and learning languages. And, and then, um, well, I, I was living in New Zealand basically, but I was studying dolphins from the Amazon and from the Caribbean. Um, and I never really disconnected with Colombia and with the scientists in Colombia. So at the end of my PhD, I was, a, I was actually able to go back to Colombia and start as an, um, as an assistant professor at Los Andes. So where I did my undergrad. So it was, that, that was pretty much my path. So since then it has been 11 years since I started at the university as a professor. And now I'm, I am an associate professor. Um, and I have a, a research lab doing conservation genetics, not only on cetaceans, but actually on a whole bunch of things, right, Anna, like fish and turtles and crocodiles and, of course, dolphins and whales, as always, manatees and a lot of other stuff. But I'm very lucky to be able to work here and to teach new generations of Colombian scientists. That's excellent. Thank you, Susanna. Um, and Diana, if you could just let us know a little bit about what your career path has been and what you're working on now. Sure. So hi, everyone. And thank you, Ana Maria, for inviting me today. I'm happy to be here. Um, so my career path is maybe a little bit different from, from the other two panelists. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer by training, uh, and I slowly moved into the very biology-focused <laughs> field. Um, so I also studied in University of Los Andes. I guess that's the common tie that we have here. Um, I was always interested in medicine, but I also liked engineering and materials. So my mechanical engineering studies kind of merged into biomaterials and using mechanical engineering to design devices and, and um, technologies for medicine. Uh, I moved to do my, I started to do my master's after my undergrad. Um, I was working in this vascular crafts to regenerate arteries. Um, after that, I needed a little bit of a break from, from academia. So I went to an IP law firm for one year. That was a very enriching experience in that it really helped me shape my mind around how to think about technology. And I was always more inclined into transferring technologies and doing something that will get to a patient eventually. So um, just thinking about how patents are, are put together in that they formulate a need, uh, state what the field is at right now, and then what the solution is really um, kind of made an impact on me. Um, however, after a year doing um, work in the patent law world, um, I really wanted to go back to being more of a somebody who will be creating the technologies rather than being reviewing the patents. So I started my PhD in Los Andes, which was also, um, it required a year abroad. So I split that year uh, in six months at University of Pittsburgh and six months at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Um, and my thesis had like three different portions that I could do in the three different labs. So that was very enriching. Um, and simultaneously with this, we were um, working with my advisor on how to translate the technologies that we were creating at the lab. So not only the vascular graph that I was working on, but other technologies that we were working on at the lab. And we made this link with the School of Business Administration um, just to think about the business development plans or, or, or business plans um, to, to make this in innovations come out of the lab and, and get to the patients. Uh, we participated in a number of business plan competitions across the US, which was also a lot of fun for me. I had no problem with staying up at night, uh, just working on these business plans because it, to me, it showed the value of what we were doing and really actually making these things impact a patient someday. So after that, um, which was done in parallel with my PhD, I, I finished up and I came to do my postdoc uh, to Boston at uh, Massachusetts, Ionier and um, Harvard Medical School. So I had a two, a postdoc that was a two year appointment. I was working in a vascular biology lab. So that's when I really ended up in the biology world and um, just using bi my biomaterial for vascular biology applications. Um, and after that, I kind of wanted to take a step back. I remembered how much I enjoyed writing business plans and looking at how to translate technology. So 
um, exploring career options, I landed in Harvard's Office of Technology Development in the Corporate Alliances team. So basically what we do is that we manage industry alliances that we have at Harvard. So alliances with pharmaceutical companies um, um, to support, um, to do some kind of industry sponsored research to support research projects that would um, at some point deliver a next set of therapeutics for uh, therapeutic areas that are of common interest between Harvard and those institutions. So I've been here for three and a half years uh, and it's been very, very enriching as well and exciting. That's great, thank you, Diana. Um, so I have a couple of, of questions for each of you. Um, Natalia, um, you mentioned that you are from Colombia and that you worked in Mexico for a while and now you're working in the US. Um, and we were wondering um, about your experience is in those different cultures and countries. Um, and when you got to the US and when you got to Mexico, did you have any situations of like culture shock or differences in work styles that were that were very apparent? Thanks, Kathy. So I think comparing a cultural and work style differences between Mexico and the US is a little bit tricky in my case because it, this, these differences also arise from the different stages in my formation, in my academic formation, right? So, but I'm gonna try to do a good effort here. <laughs> so uh, the, the main difference that I will say I have between Mexico and the US are like the fact that, uh, because once again, because of my formation here is, is more like research based and more collaborative based. My research in Mexico was under a PI a advising and a research, one of a few research projects looking for. So I was like in a, in a student mode in Mexico. Then I moved to the state and the mode changes or shifts to having not one but multiple mentoring the students, having multiple research projects going on. So it became more collaborative. And I feel that now that's a great feeling. And now even some of those collaborations can go back to Mexico and even other countries, some in Colombia, some in Mexico. So the experience is quite different. Now, in terms of cultural shock, definitely there's a cultural shock. So I think my decision, uh, I didn't come, as I kind of uh, mentioned earlier, I didn't come to the States to pursue a graduate level degree because uh, I didn't think back then that my English level was good enough. I didn't even try to apply to schools here. I was thinking, I was looking for my options in Latin places or even in Europe because I knew that more people were going to be struggling with language, not only me. So I wasn't planning to come to the States at any point of my formation career because I was seeing that as a barrier. But then that is still being our year when I realized that my efforts were good enough and I could communicate with other uh, fellas in, let's say, good enough English. So that very that very first language was gone. But then comes second barriers or second cultural shock that is leaving family and friends behind. Right. In terms of work styles, as I say, those come confounded with the different roles that I was having. But definitely I have learned, and I think that also has to do with the evolution of yourself and trying to learn what are the best habits for you in your academic career. So I also learned to manage my time a little better, to be more disciplined. And some of, some of that it has also to do with how productivity here in the States moves a little bit faster. Not because we're lazy, we work very hard in Latin America, just things happen a little bit slower because our resources are a little bit slower <laughs> too. So those are the main cultural shocks, how fast things happen here and, and the cultural of family and friends. Now, just to give you an example that how fast things happen here, I have always been like in front of the, the, on the row, in the front row of preparing things for the lab. So in Mexico, it will take me sometimes a month to order and have a reagents in a lab to be able to mentor students and teach students or even to produce data. And here in the States, sometimes I see 
oh, I just run out of a reagent and I just go to the freezer downstairs. And those are tiny, tiny differences that we don't routinely think about. But I think those are extremely important when you're in a, in a country or in a place where those resources take a little, are a little bit hard, harder to get. So yeah, those are quite the main types. Of yeah, those tiny differences, you know, can really accumulate and make a big difference. So. All right. yeah. Um, so um, I have a question for Diana next. So Diana, um, you've um, done a lot of work in academia. Um, you said you worked at an IP firm as well. And now you, you're in your work, you are really um, collaborating a lot with people from industry. Um, when you're interacting with people with industry and with academia, what, what are the differences that you see there? Um, and how can you navigate these differences successfully? Right, so I think in terms of interactions um you know i i don't see a lot of of differences I, I don't know if you know the question is in the context of being a latino woman or just a woman or anybody <laughs> um I, I mean part of my role is actually to understand how everybody works because i'm in a very kind of diplomatic role where my job is to make sure things run smoothly and um, so that's that's something I do just try to ensure that I have a good interaction with everybody I speak with. And it, it usually just runs down to personality. Um, I think it, of course, helps me that I've been a researcher myself so that I can understand how to communicate with um, the, the principal investigators and everybody at academia that I'm working with. Um, and then on the industry side, I also it's also helpful to understand how each company works and try to understand their organizations, try to understand their goals. Um, so that when I hear a request from a company regarding a project, I can understand where they're coming from. And then I kind of can kind of translate that to, to, the, to the academic uh, part of the team. Um, and that's, so going along those lines, that is also a big part of, of the, the role I have here is try to, you know, have that navigate that cultural difference between industry and academia where goals are different, right? Academia is looking to discover science and, and understand things and not necessarily get to the point where you're designing a therapy while industry, um, yes, they wanna understand the biology underlying a certain mechanism, but it's all targeted or, or aimed into developing uh, a therapy. And I was talking to Anna Maria actually, earlier because I wanted to, you know, understand a little bit better the question and see if I could contribute in other ways. And uh, maybe this will touch on this later, but I'll bring it up now in terms of um, the type of people I see in different meetings or teams. So um, I would say in academia, I do see a lot more um, women professors and lead principal investigators, whereas lead executives and in industry might be more, you know, traditional, just uh, male. Um, and that does happen in meetings. But I think it, if, if I take a look at my meetings and I was kind of paying attention to my meetings today and see how many women are joining, many of them are, are balanced. And I think we're in a good track. We just need to, to keep, keep going. Great, thank you. That must be, um, it must take a lot of uh, nuance and ability to kind of get the goals of the academics and the goals of the people in industry aligned. Um, how, how, do you, how do you manage that? Do you have any tricks or? Well, it's a, like, sometimes it takes me, you know, half an hour, an hour to write an email because I have to be very careful about what word to pick and how to say, and it's a lot of influencing without authority, right? We're working with this very high level uh, faculty and uh, I need to ask them for something, but I have to be very careful in how I, I manage. So it's speaking the right words, um, you know, trying to explain, provide context. Sometimes we do have obligations with our contracts. So, you know, that helps <laughs> in communicating those things. And um, yeah, and vice versa, right, with industry and, and it's really important for us to understand the organization and who, how every person likes to operate. And it goes down even to knowing what works better with each person, an email, a quick phone call, um, 
sometimes maybe you need to ask somebody else to talk to this person. It, it just depends. So it's a lot of paying attention to everybody's style. Thank you. That's great. Um, Susanna, I have a question for you. So Susanna, you seem to have lived just about everywhere, um, many, many countries. Um, and we were hoping to get some of your insight into um, as you go from to different countries and even different continents, what are some, some similarities or differences that you see? And there, are there kind of like themes or categories of similarities or differences between different cultures and countries? Well, um, I would I would kind of classify that, let's say the like cultures. So whenever you are or you visit or you work with people, let's say from Latin America, um, I guess you like the best thing that I found is to be pretty much pretty straightforward and say the things as clear as you can. I mean, not being rude or anything like that, but just be very direct, very clear of what you are, what you want to achieve and what's the kind of work that you want to do. And, and, and honestly be, be very, very, you know, very clear and, and always be yourself, which is truth for every culture. However, whenever I get the opportunity to work with, let's say people, for, for example, in New Zealand, people were super, you know, very, very sorry, this is crazy, we're on vacation. Um, we, let's say people were super polite. And so you couldn't be that straightforward because otherwise you could be interpreted as rude um so you had to be a little bit more you know more kind of careful with with the way you approach people and the way you did the work and and a little bit i mean in america i would say it's pretty much the like if you are clear with what you expect and what you want to do and 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 in a of course in a in a very clear way in saying that you what you want to achieve and how you want, for instance, a collaboration to go and what are the terms of that collaboration? I guess that's the main thing. But some places you can be very Latin in the sense of being quite direct and and sometimes, you know, you can put a little bit of, of humor into the creation and so kind of make it more, you know, more, more relaxed and friendly. Some other times you have to be a little bit more um, kind of, how would you say that, a little bit more reserved. I would mm -hmm. say so. Yeah. Are there are there cultures, a lot of learning? Are there cultural differences between Latin American countries, though? Because Latin America, that's a huge span, and there's lots of different countries there, and I feel like there's probably different cultures within some of the different countries you've worked in in Latin America. Yeah. Well, I I felt pretty comfortable working pretty much with everyone around. Mm -hmm. uh, Brazil has been a challenge sometimes. Uh, because there's, I found that somehow, I don't know if it's just in the field of, of aquatic mammals only um, or, or in other fields, but people tend to be super protective of their work and their research and, and they, you know, and they're like, oh, if you are going to collaborate with this person, then I'm not going to collaborate with you or, and you just want to do something whole and complete that you, you want to get the whole picture of, let's say, um, the population structure of a, of a species and then, oh no, because if you work with that person, I don't want to work with you on that. So it's, you know, it takes a lot of diplomacy as Diana was saying, I mean, she has to be very diplomatic between and like very careful with the way she approaches people in industry and people in, in more academia. Here, pretty much like in Brazil, I felt that you have to be a little bit careful with you know, with the different groups that you approach to work on a certain matter. In the other place in Latin America, I don't know, I feel that pretty much is is in some way simpler. Mm. Interesting. Um, so I have a question that I'm gonna ask all of you. So um, you'll get a chance to, to think about the answer. Um, Basically, it's around what the challenges that, that women, and in particular Latinas, face um, in science and having a scientific career. Um, so, Natalia, can I start with you first? Yes. Thank you, Kathy. Well, I 
think that although the term Latinas includes, as you say, a variety of cultures and economy, it might be sometimes difficult to make some generalizations, but I'm gonna try to do my best. So I'll say that there are two main challenges that I can, I, I in my perspective, there's two main challenges that not only Latinas, I will generalize this enough to say Latinas and Latino populations may face. The, the first one is the, I think I'll connect this to my previous answer, is resources. So in living in developing economies is a little bit different than living in emerging economies, right? So uh, I'm gonna expand on this resource thing because uh, I wanted to make clear, to make, I want to make clear what I'm referring. So I'm thinking about two types of resources mainly. One is the one that is available to the average person. So let's say a student that wants to pursue a career in the STEM field. And if we're taking the average student in a developing economy in Colombia or Mexico or any Latin place, that student he has barely his, uh, his basic rights Right. So now let's talk about scholarly or educational resources. So those are sometimes hard to provide. And those are the ones that Latin countries or at least the ones that are struggling more economically are lacking of. So from there, we start from a, a, a little bit further uh, line than our emerging uh, economy. So that's one of the challenges where we want to compare Latin uh, scientists to the rest. And I'll say that the second challenge, and okay, and the second type of resource that I meant is infrastructure and lab uh, or educational resources. Now, the second challenge, I'll say language. And this is important in science in particular because science is a field that is told or taught or written or communicated in general in English. And once again, let's take the average student that wants to pursue a career in science, we have a very broken English background if you come from an average uh, high school, right? So that could be a first barrier that most of our students are presenting. Now, let's say that a student develops a skills in English, that, they, but then to convince ourselves that we're good in English and we can still try to make and communicate science effectively, is that like is now an individual barrier that most of us can face. But uh, with that, so just to circle back to your question, to the challenges, let's add the challenge of being a woman in any society, right? That is most societies, and as Diana say, especially industry are male dominated uh, communities that it's even harder for women to make a, a point. But I, I agree with Diana and also the sense that in academy is not necessarily true. I can't say how many wonderful mentors and professors I have that were women and inspired me to, to pursue this path. And that support system also becomes very, very important for all those that are trying to pursue a STEAM career. So I think our challenges are mostly resources and barrier, language barriers challenges, yes. I mute myself. My dogs are barking too. Um, Susanna, um, how about you? What are the, the challenges that you face in your career or that you see other, other women um, and Latinas in science facing? Um, I, I still think that there's, a, that there's um, but, well, particularly in, in Latin America, but I would say still in the world, um, science is still a very male dominated field. And sometimes in, in our institutions, we feel that. You can feel that male kind of domination, you know, feeling, uh, for instance, because like, for, for instance, I felt um, when, when, my, when I first started at the university and, and I, was, I had a, um, a little boy, my son was a year and a half. And um, I remember some of my colleagues who were who were men. Um, they would they would they would I don't know they would organize meetings at eight o'clock in the morning, and so I would be like, well, sorry, I can't make it because I have to take my kid to kindergarten to daycare. Um, and so and they would be like, you know, they were like, oh, always Susanna always have he has issues, 
you know? And so I still feel that there's a lot of that going on. That if you, and I see, I see it also with my students, with my women students uh, that happen to be mothers. Um, sometimes they feel, you know, sometimes they even feel, I feel this, 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 a little bit of shame, kind of like, oh, I can't do it because my kids, you know, and uh, I, I may not be able to go for such a long time to the field. Because, and so I still feel that the, that the system is not, is not very supportive very supportive for women in general but i don't but I, and, and especially for mothers like if a woman independently of their their history in their life if if a woman decides to be a mother and have you know both world a professional world and a and a, and a family world i still feel there's a lot of challenges there that that women have to face sometimes we even have to face that in our own family setting or set up. Like sometimes even husbands are not that super supportive. Um, and if you have like my ex-husband is also in science and technology, he's also a professor at a different university. And and I think there was a, a little bit of difficulties there because of, you know, because of MV, because of oh, well, how come she's in this university and I have to teach here, you know? And, and so I, I still think the world is not very supportive for women, especially those that are mothers in science. And if we as, as professors and as mentors and as um, principal investigators, if we could somehow provide a safe and kind of welcoming and supporting environment for those women that are also mothers in science, I think that would be simply amazing. Um, I've had I've had one student who um, who was also a mom and she just she finished her her PhD um, about two years ago um, and and it, it was simply amazing. I mean, she would take her daughter on field trips and um, she was able to take her daughter to Europe to part of her for part of those six months um, internship for her PhD with her and so. You know, having that safe and, and so that women can actually tell you, look, I have a kid, but I want to go ahead with my career. And I, a few months ago, I had one student who she, she wanted to apply for the master's and she was almost as if she was embarrassed of telling me that she was a mother. And I was like, no, it's fantastic. And I myself am a mom. And so I would be totally happy to have you being a mom, being part of my research group. And she was really surprised. So I think that, that we still, we are still missing that. We still need that bit of additional support for those women. Thank you, Susanna. That's a great example. Um, so I'm gonna ask the same question of Diana. Um, I also wanted to, to let our audience know um, that after Diana answers, we're gonna open it up to audience questions. Um, you can post your questions in the Q&A if you have them. Um, and now I'm just going to turn to Diana and Diana, I'm um, ask you about what are the, the challenges that you faced um, being a Latina in science. Right, so I'm, I'm going to go with Natalia's point of resources. So definitely was really frustrating when I was in Colombia trying to do my research and, and you know, going back and forth to, to labs in the US and then coming back and uh, you know, we had all these ideas. We had the funds, but just getting a hold of an ELISA kit just couldn't happen. It, it was a year and I just couldn't. And I had this amazing team of master's students who were ready to do this. And it was just very frustrating and same thing, right? You, you get here and I would be, um, you know, in my postdoc think, thinking at 3 p.m., oh, I need this antibody and then the, the the tech that supported the lab had it on my desk the next morning. I was like, wow, <laughs> like, there is no limitation, right? So, so it, it really helps move forward science and just, just, you know, resources are no limitations, just your creativity and your bandwidth. And so I think that's, that's something that, you know, it was a challenge uh, back there um, in, in Latin America, you know, having, and having that structure, um, not only on the on the resources side, um, 
because back then, and I don't know how it is now, but back then there wasn't really an infrastructure to support just research. So I felt like the person who was ordering paper for the printer was also ordering my ELISA kit and it was just not just getting blocked and it was just not working. So it needed a little bit of that. It also needed a little bit of, um, or there, there's a difference in that here, many research professors are mostly about, devoted to research and only have to teach one class. While a lot of professors back then, back there have to teach three or four classes, undergrad classes, which take a lot of time to prepare and you have to do, you know, um, grade and, and have office hours and it just takes a lot of your time. So you can only do research in the summer and maybe a little bit in, in December, but then like you also want to have some family time. So um, that was that was also a challenge. Um, for me in particular, I, uh, I think I was lucky in the types of labs that I, I landed in. Um, First time that I came to the US, I was to Georgia Tech for a summer internship. My, my advisor told me, don't think that you're less than anybody else here. You learn with the same books, you have the same pencil. Um, you know, you, you know the same science, so don't feel like you're less. And I did find that it helped me build my confidence. And, and I found that later on. Uh, you know, I would ask questions that people would think were valuable and were the right questions that they were trying to answer themselves. So, um, you know, it's it's just having that boost of confidence in that we're also getting good education. Yes, we have limitations, um, but, you know, we're, we're getting there. And I think also on a positive note, I do see a lot of international people at Harvard and other places. So, um, I was, in fact, I think Pittsburgh was my the, the one place that shocked me because there were a lot of Americans <laughs> and I wasn't used to seeing so many. Mm -hmm. It's usually like foreign people dominated. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think it's, it's we're getting there and it's a matter of also building that confidence to to just know that, you know, we, we have good brains, good ideas, and we just have to keep pushing. Great, Diana. Thank you. Um, I think that's great. And I, I take some advice from all of that about, um, you know, making sure that that people who are international students have that confidence. I think that seems important, um, as well as that, you know, the advice, Susanna, you gave about making sure that we um, support moms in the workplace and that and that by supporting moms, we're good role models, um, not just for other women, but also for other men in the workplace, because they should be supporting moms, too. So that's great. Um, I think we have a couple of audience questions. I think Raphael, do you uh, do you have those questions teed up? Are you going to ask them? Uh, yes, I can go ahead. Great. So, first question we have from the audience: uh, As someone who is looking to get into Alliance, and I, and I think this is uh, probably Diana. for Diana. Yeah. Uh, as someone who is looking to get into Alliance management, how can my resume or CV to showcase my skills to pivot my career? Yeah, so uh, we actually had a couple of people join the team this, this year. Uh, one of them, she came from a postdoc similar to like my path. So, um, you know, what I did that was very helpful was my experience in, in, in the um, IP world uh, because what we do in alliance management is very related to IP. Um, also doing all those business plans uh, and just learning a little bit more of the of the business of science also helps me even today to to do what I do. Um, part uh, one person in, in our team, um, she she did actually a fellowship in our office. So our office and other tech transfer offices at universities have sometimes fellowships for grad students or postdocs. So you can do a six month, one year, and you get to, to see how this world works, get get a little bit acquainted with, with what the sort of things that are done and then that helps um, build the skill set. And the other person that joined the team, she was in consulting. So that's also very like aligned with what we do. So um, it's just been very helpful. And I think, um, it's also a personality thing that if, if you want to be in this track is 
it's um you know it's very interesting because you get to do to see a lot of exciting science i myself wanted to step back from the bench but i still love science so i get to see amazing science that it's just done by somebody else um so you you have to enjoy science also enjoy just just driving things so it's, it's kind of similar to project manager but also with those nuances of of having the personality thing um but in, in terms of building resume, those would be my advice, seeing if there's any like, um, you know, technology clubs, uh, consulting clubs, university, looking into fellowships at tech transfer offices, uh, even IP law firms. All of those are kind of aligned with what we do um, and, and that would be a good entry path. Great, thank you. Um, next question we have from the audience and reminder for all attendees, uh, if you have any questions, please post them directly on the Q&A box uh, and we'll be able to queue them up. Um, so the next question um, I think goes to anyone uh, who would like to uh, jump in. Uh, do you mentor younger folks? Oh, Susanna, I think Susanna would like to start. Yeah, well, definitely. Um, I, I, I do, I, I mentor uh, undergraduate students uh, that come to lab. Sometimes they even come in their, in their initial semesters. I've had students starting, I started working in the lab and kind of, you know, helping the, the, the PhD students or helping the master's students, even as as young as let's say third or fourth semester. And so I've had actually a couple of students like that that started with me very, very young and actually ended up doing their, their honors thesis and then their master's thesis with me as well. Um, and, and it's just a fantastic um, opportunity to meet uh, people and to, to actually, you know, kind of, kind of show them how science um, can be and how it can work for them. So yeah, definitely uh, mentoring students is just, is, at least for me, it's one of my favorite activities. And if I may say something to that, as Susanna mentioned at the beginning, she was my PI and she was actually the person that sat next to me when I did my first PCR. Um, and I can say that mentoring and having women like all of you be mentors, it really kind of makes you want to be part of science and just keep pursuing. Um, so thank you. <laughs> so yes, I just wanted to add that I also enjoy a lot, like Susanna say, it's one of the most rewarding experiences to mentor and make people excited about science as much as you are. So having conversations and answering questions is a very rewarding experience. But I think like as Latinas, that's especially important because you're also creating that role model system that you wanna, your fellow Latinas students or your fellow younger students to be excited and good in science as you can be. So this is not only one experience that we're privileged as professors to have, but also it's a very important in our society for them to have these role models and say, oh, science might be ex an exciting path to follow. So yeah. Thank you. Um, I wonder if we can finish up um, with um, each of you perhaps giving us some advice um, on um, just being a Latina in science and, and how can you can advance um, maybe both in science, but even just like in your in your personal life and uh, have a, a happy and, and successful career. You can start Natalia, you're on the screen. Start? Okay, <laughs> I'm just gonna say that Definitely for, in my personal experience, what is the most important is to have a, a big and beautiful and connected support system. And that comes from your family, that comes from your workplace, that will, comes from your lab mates, from your PIs. And I think just because I have been lucky enough to have that support system is I am where I am right now. So in those terms, I think the best advice that I can give to any fellow Latinos, Latinas, and even to my young class of students that are, come from different parts of the world, 
is that if you're found in a situation that you like the topics, but you don't see that you're in a very support system, that you instead of feeling that you're growing in that community, you're quite sinking, we need to teach our youngers that they should be able to speak up and get out of that system. And we, let me tell you that there's so many amazing scientists and technologies out there that for sure you can knock on our doors and find someone that wants to support you if you're really that passionate about science. So uh, that will be my first advice. Get out of a system if it, you're not growing in there. And my second advice is to get curious, get excited. And because science is one of the most beautiful careers that you can have. So you need that curiosity and always be looking for opportunities. So if it wasn't because I was curious about the opportunities where I met Anna, for example, or the opportunities that even the US was granting to Latin students, is that I'm able to be here today too. So be curious, it, put your antenna out for opportunities and be optimist. I think our science field, I am an optimist and I think it's progressing. We're, kind, we're trying to be aware about the importance of diversity, equality and justice in science. And so probably more opportunities will arise for those that may need it the most. So always be attentive to those. Thank you, Natalia. Um, Susanna, what advice do you have for our audience? Um, I would say um, I love what Natalia just said about having a, a great support system. I mean, I guess I, I would never be able to do my science if it wasn't because of my family and, and their support and their example. Um, but also I think, and I would say, be very stubborn and persevere. Um, if you really want something, you just have to keep going. I mean, you may, you know, you may knock on many doors and they may close them in your nose. But it, if you keep going, if you keep being perseverant, um, you are going to make it and you are going to be able to find the, 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 the you are going to be able to build the path that you want for yourself um, and be, and, and be that, be stubborn. I mean, I remember, um, I remember myself like crying because um, somebody like treated me really badly when I said that I wanted to study dolphin genetics and closing their door on my nose, right? But then again, with family support and my mom saying like, oh, it doesn't matter. That person doesn't know anything about you and doesn't know what you are able to do. Um, that you just, you know, you keep going. And the other thing is that it's great that you are curious and excited, um, but also keep, you know, do different things, not just diversify. Science is one of your loves, but you can love many, many things. So don't forget about the other things that, that make you the person you are. So don't forget that if you like dancing, go ahead and dance. It's not going to, the, the paper that you're writing is not going to change for one hour that you go and dance. You know what I mean? So just keep doing all those other things that will fit into your science as well and into your way of, of advancing your career. That's great, Susanna, thank you. Um, Diana, what, what tips do you have for the audience? What advice do you have? Right, so I love the support system advice. Yeah, I also was lucky enough to have it, so for sure. And I think uh, I'll build up on my on my point of you know building confidence and just going for things and insisting. Um, I love the point of just persevere and you know not not to be afraid. Email that big time professor that works in the field that you love because. He might be having problems just finding, I, I know <laughs> labs at Harvard that have problems just finding students that are talented. So you might as well just reach out. Um, and there's so many tools right now, everybody, right? The, the, online, there's so many things you can do, even on LinkedIn, just reach out. It, it, the worst thing that will happen is they say no, or they don't reply, it doesn't matter. But just keep trying, uh, get informed, attend to events, do networking. Networking is so valuable. Um, that's partly how I landed here. Um, and I'm, I'm really happy that, that I did this choice. So um, yeah, just, just there's, again, so many resources online. 
read, get acquainted with all the different um, career paths that there are, because um, I still think I'm a scientist just doing something different. But, um, you know, you might think maybe just you don't want to be pipetting right now, or you don't want to do the deal with the data right now, but you still want to be in there. There's so many other alternative careers where you can still shine. I know people who have started uh, you know, in the lab and then them slowly merge into other different interests that they found that they have and they, they've enjoyed. I know people who are very high level in, in commercial and they're still pushing forward valuable therapies for, for patients. They're just doing it in a different uh, way. Uh, and, you know, in my experience in, in alliance management, I can see that everybody that I speak with has a lot of scientific knowledge. I have to read a lot to keep up. So, um, you know, there's a lot of alternative careers. Uh, just inform yourself, look everywhere, and, and don't be afraid to send that email to the big names. They might reply. That's great. So those are good suggestions. I heard curiosity and perseverance and confidence and diversity and networking and all um, I think underpinned by a support system. So that's great advice. I am going to hand it over to Anna Marie right now to do some closing remarks. Oh, well, thank you, Kathy. Thank you for also helping and doing an amazing job at hosting this talk. Um, so yes, I agree with you. Those remarks from our panelists are, are great and I think they're very uplifting. And I think it also gives us good perspective that we, as some of you mentioned, are increasing our diversity and we're aware of the importance of it. Um, so this is why we also here at Latinx wanted to showcase our work and do these type of talks um, just to celebrate who we are as a community and just to talk about topics that might be of interest. So I want to thank again everyone or all our people that join and are attending our talk. I want to talk to Rafael and Kathy for helping me co-host this meeting and of course to Diana, Susana, and Natalia for taking their valuable time and just sharing with us their expertise, their everything, everything that they share with us. So thank you very much. And if anyone has any questions or anything, they can always reach out to us at Latinx. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. <laughs>